Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. I'm at the Hecla Volcano in Iceland. Uh, took a drive up with Erica and a friend of ours, Pete Moorefield. They have gone up here to go hiking up closer towards the summit. But I wanted to stop here. There's only so far I can drive up that trail before things start to get a little sketchy. I wanted to stop here and just give you all a little bit of a view and then go answer some of your questions. This is one of the more active volcanoes in Iceland. When it blows, it's a pretty big deal, but obviously we're going to try and hope for not having that today. That's Hekla if you want to learn more about it, H-E-K-L-A. So what do we got here? First up is Mehdi. Mehdi asks, hi Brent. How do I find the progress of a long executing transaction, like a delete statement, an update statement, a rebuild index operation, before deciding whether or not to kill the transaction? Unfortunately, it's extremely hard to do this. SQL Server introduced live execution plans back around uh, 2016, 2017, but you had to turn on a trace flag in order to get live query plans and live query statistics. And once the transaction's already started, you can't just turn on the trace flag and retroactively get progress on a query. The trace flag has to be turned on before the query starts. The good news is, is if you're on SQL Server 2019, if you're on 2019 or newer as of this recording, uh, live query plans is turned on automatically. So if you use SP Blitz Who, for example, SP Blitz Who will show you the live query plans, and then you can see roughly what percentage through SQL Server is on the various operations inside the query plan. The thing I just make you aware of though, when you decide to kill something, is you're not just killing the current statement, they might have typed begin tran an hour ago, and when you kill it, you're gonna to have to roll back all the things that they did during that transaction, and rollbacks are single threaded. So it can be really ugly. You might be looking at a really simple query that just only needs a little bit to finish, or you might think that it hasn't done that much work yet, when in reality that transaction has done all kinds of other things prior. So there's really no safe way to tell, unfortunately. Next up, Viking asks, I have a 50 gig vendor database. After an update, CheckDB went from taking 20 minutes to three and a half days. Is there anything that come to mind to explain such a change? Standouts for the database configuration includes file stream and service broker. Oh, you're playing feature bingo. You're trying to use all the different features. So let's talk like big picture. What would make a CheckDB take longer? Things like, indexed views, where SQL Server has to recheck the contents of all that indexed view from scratch. Things that are very computationally intensive to check, like scalar user-defined functions that are used as persisted computed columns. Um, so the thing that I would start with though, is I would try just DBCC check DB with physical only. The with physical only option only checks the checksums on the 8K pages. So it just reads the entire database very quickly, checks the checksum on every page. If that operation sucks too, you have a storage problem. There's something inside the SQL Server that's causing it to read those pages more slowly. Because I worry that it may not just be a problem inside your application, it may be an underlying problem on the storage itself. The update might have been just a red herring. Um, the other thing, and I'm just throwing things out loud here because it could be all kinds of stuff. Uh, another thing that it could be is you could be on SQL Server 2019 and you could be using scalar user-defined functions and you might have hit one of those updates where SQL Server turned off the inlining of those scalar user-defined functions. I haven't seen a case where that's ever made CheckDB take much longer because of course it's not supposed, Check 2019 wasn't supposed to make uh, persisted computed columns based on scalar UDFs faster, but now hope, hopefully that just starts to give you an idea of why it would be such a big surface area to go check, speaking of big surface areas a big surface area to go check. That's why I'd start with that physical only switch to rule out hardware. Next up, James says, when I'm failing over an availability group server to a secondary, sometimes a random database will get stuck in a resolving state, causing lots of work to fix. Is there something I could possibly check to prevent this? 
No, I, I've had several clients have problems with failovers, uh, especially with long running transactions inside those. Somebody just posted a blog post recently about ghost transactions too. Uh, ghost transactions that were piling up trying to do work on a checkpoint and then on failover they caused problems. Um, but because of the complexity on that, that's a great example of when I'd say call Microsoft for support. It's not like they're going to instantly have an answer either, but this is one of those that's so important on a production type server that you want to get Microsoft involved sooner rather than later. You don't want to play random detective asking some yo-yo who's standing on a, a volcano for help. Go call the pros over at Microsoft. Uh, next up, Joe Gleason asks, should developers be given permissions to run traces in a production environment? If so, under what conditions? Um, a, a lot of people in the audience are immediately reacting with rabid, uh, you know, f drool coming down like, oh my god, never, never allow them in. But here's a scenario where I can imagine stuff like that happening. You have a really tiny team, think like two, three, four developers. You don't have a full-time production DBA. The data that's inside the database isn't personally identifiable or sensitive. Maybe it's stuff that it wouldn't really matter if people see it. And the server's under relatively low load and we're trying to investigate something. I've seen a lot of cases like that where there's a really small staff size and the database isn't all that critical and people just want to get across the finish line faster for troubleshooting. That's the kind of scenario where I can imagine it. However, on the flip side of that, if there is a production mission critical aspect to the database where we can't stand to slow down transactions, I get really nervous doing tracing because if someone runs a profiler trace on a query, you slow down your query, which then slows down other queries, which can cause blocking pileups in the server. So. I would just ask what the problem is that we're trying to solve and if there's a more efficient way of solving that problem. Next up we have Stanislav. Stanislav asks, I have a data warehouse SQL server. It's got 700 gigs of RAM and 10 CPUs with two NUMA nodes. Maxdop was two now, it was two now and it was four before. I just get the feeling I'm getting random buzzwords. Now more than before, locking weight types occurred and have, it's killing me. Am I able to reduce blocking by myself as a database beginner or only in cooperative cooperation with developers in order to optimize the code? Okay, so let's kind of zoom back a little and let's ask the question, how do I reduce blocking? There are three ways that you can reduce blocking. One, you can tune the indexes have as few indexes as possible in order to support your workloads, not so many indexes that SQL Server has to grab locks across all of them when you, as you're doing inserts, updates, and deletes. Two, tune your queries. Don't type begin tran and then do all kinds of things inside the database. Make your transactions as short and sweet as possible. And then three, use the right isolation level for your application's needs. Typically, read committed snapshot isolation or snapshot isolation are better fits as opposed to the default isolation level for SQL Server. So those three are the ways that you can do it. Two of those ways, you don't need developers in order to do. I go through those in my mastering classes. On the tuning indexes piece, I teach you in mastering index tuning. The tuning queries piece, I teach you specifically around blocking in mastering query tuning. And in the isolation levels piece, I teach you that in mastering server tuning. So hopefully that gets you started. Uh, next up, Jaden says, how do I understand big and complex queries with a lot of subqueries quickly? For me, often folks will bring in a large query and they'll say, just make this go faster. I don't necessarily need to understand the whole query. What I do is I work through the execution plan from right to left, top to bottom. The top right thing inside the execution plan is the place where SQL Server starts. 
start at that operator of the plan and look at your estimated versus actual numbers. Look for the place where your estimates versus actual go to hell in a handbasket and then try to improve that portion of your query either by changing the way that the query works, changing the indexes in it, breaking the query into pieces, regrouping a tiny query into bigger pieces. And I cover that extensively in my Mastering Query Tuning class, but hopefully at least that gets you started. And then finally, the last one will take Rent-A-Balloon. Rent-A-Balloon says, I wanna know, my friend wants to know, what's the optimal way to execute procedures on a processing queue? For example, run a stored procedure or a set of stored procedures for each row in a given table. My friend keeps coming back to cursors and while loops, even though he knows they're bad. Well, on one hand, I would say you're, the most op optimal way to do that is you change the code to be set-based. This isn't new advice. It's been the same advice for like 30 years out in databases. If you want to get a lot of work done, you don't do it one row at a time. You write your code to work in batches of rows. But if you do have to only work one row at a time, what you want to do is multi-thread that work. You want to have lots of apps that can all grab, or lots of app servers that can all grab a row, do the necessary work, and then move on to the next row. Think about parallelizing that work. Cursors and while loops are painfully slow because they're single-threaded working through one row at a time. That would be kind of like just doing one piece of work, having one person involved and wondering why it doesn't go faster. You want to get more people involved, parallelize that work, but start by trying to set base that operation instead. Well, all right, my friends are coming down now from the peak over at Hecla. You can see them uh, coming down the trail now. Now, I'm so I will stop here, go pack up my camera gear, and we'll go start driving down, back down uh, Hecla. And today we're going in through the central highlands of Iceland, driving around to uh, Land Manalugar and looking at one of my favorite waterfall places on Earth. Just absolutely gorgeous scenery. So I will see y'all at the next office hours. Adios. <laughs>